Today I will tell you about uh, changes in household and family structure in, industri in industrialized countries. Here's a family from the middle of the 20th century. This is our traditional breadwinner husband, housekeeper, wife uh, family where a man works in the labor market and a uh, woman takes care of the household and the children. They have three children. How, this is how families look today. Uh, things change. They have uh, now both uh, husband and wife work. Uh, as a result, they need to juggle the responsibility of the family and the work. You see the man is still trying to tie his tie. Uh, they have two children. Uh, furthermore, today, many households do not have two parents. There is a growing number of single mothers, uh, single parents, but particularly single mothers. And of course, for them, juggling work and the family is a bigger deal. So in some sense, th things change a lot. I'm going to show you a couple of graphs just to illustrate importance of these uh, changes. What has changed? First, there has been a big decline in marriages. People marry late, and they, they get divorced more. Here's a picture of crude marriage rate, which measures the number of marriages per thousand population. It has been going down everywhere. You see the big decline in Spain in the last 10 years. Here is the picture for crude divorce rate. It measures the number of divorces per thousand population. Again, it's going up everywhere. As a result of these changes, marital status for population at a point in time changes. So if you look at the US, this is numbers from the US, in 1960, about 80 percent, more than 80 percent of uh, females between ages 25 and 54 were married, very few were divorced. Today, about 60 percent of them are married and 10 percent of them are divorced. Second, there has been a big increase in the labor force participation of married females. He gives a picture of US and Spain in 1960 in the US. About 30% of married women work. Now 70% or percent of them do. Spain in 1980 looked like US in 1960, but it has been catching up pretty fast. This is possibly one of the most important changes in labor markets in any given country. Furthermore, Along this process, there has been a big increase in educational attainment of females. Again, here's the picture for US and Spain. Initially, less than 10% of women have college degree, university degree. Today, about 30% of them do. Indeed, among younger cohorts in any industrialized country today, there are more women with college graduates than men. This is a big change. At the same time, in US and few other countries, we, ob we observe an increase in assortative mating. What is assortative mating? Assortative mating is the tendency of people to get married with people who look like themselves, in particular in terms of education. How you can measure this, you can look at the correlation, how correlated educational attainments of husbands and wives. And it has increased in the US quite a bit in, over this period. So people are, people are more likely to marry someone who have the similar educational level as themselves. We all know about the decline in fertility. Here's a picture of total fertility rate, which measures number of kids a woman have over their lifetime. Before, in 1960s, all numbers are close to three, two and a half. Goes down everywhere. Stabilizes in US and UK around two. But it goes, keeps going down in Spain, Italy, Germany, and it reaches levels what demographers call lowest law fertility. It can't go further than that. It's around 1.4, 1.3 kids per woman. So if I show you the typical modern family in Spain, they would have only one kid, not two. OK, what else has changed? Of course, there has been an increase in births outside of marriage. Marriage is no longer a prerequisite for having kids. Here's the fraction of births occurring outside of marriage. It's about 30% in Spain, higher in other countries. This doesn't mean, of course, 30% of the kids are growing with single mothers. People cohabit. People marry after their kids is born, but still this generated at the same time a rise in kids that live with a single uh, mother. If que so we live in a different world. If questions were allowed, at this point you could ask two things. Why are you telling us all this? Do these changes matter? Also, what can economists say about these changes? Why are you the one who telling us these changes? Let me tell you. Okay. Do these changes matter? Absolutely. They matter for children. Parental background is one of the most important determinants of how people do later in life. And differences in children's achievements by their parental background appears very early in life and persist over ages. Growing literature 
led by Professor Heckman from University of Chicago, shows the importance of fam family background for children's success later in life. These changes matter for inequality. Single parent households are more likely to be in poverty than married couple households. They matter for labor markets. Labor supply behavior of singles and married people are quite different. They of course matter for public policy. Governments spend a lot of money on social security, education, family programs. And of course, these programs are fundamentally linked to the demographic structure of the society. Now, what can economists say about these changes? There's a field of economics called family economics, and this field tries to provide a systematic analysis of family using tools of modern macroeconomics. So we put emphasis on rational behavior, which means agents understand their environment and they try to maximize their well-being. Rational behavior doesn't mean that agents have to be selfish. They might be altruistic, they might care about their children, their spouses, etc. We put emphasis on equilibrium. You cannot analyze marriage by looking at a single person. In order, if you want to understand who is married with whom and who remains single, who gets married, you have to look at the whole population. That's an equilibrium outcome. We also put emphasis on stable preferences. You don't want to explain changes by saying, okay, people change their preferences. Of course, preferences might change, but this has to be tied to fundamental changes in the economy. Family economics as a field appeared in 1960s and 70s as a result of work by fundamental contributions by Gary Becker from University of Chicago. And today it's a very active area. And, and people in family economics study issues that many people believe they are outside of economics in some sense. Okay, let me tell you a little bit more about what I do in family economics. I approach family economics from a macro perspective. So I'm interested in aggregate changes. How do I do that? I basically, be, or we basically, build, solve, and simulate models of household behavior. So these models are basically mathematical representations of how people make decisions, how they form households, et cetera, et cetera. And they are usually end up being long computer codes that can be simulated in the computers. You can add lots of heterogeneity into these models. People can differ by age, gender, education, their wages, et cetera. In the computer, agents interact. They meet each other. They decide to get married or not. Once the households are formed, they make decisions. How much to consume, how much to save, how many kids to have, whether both members should work, only one member should work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is fundamental is that these models, once you put them in a computer, they are able to generate statistics that can directly be compared with the actual data. So when I simulate my model, it tells me, okay, in this economy, 60% of the people want to get married. 40% of them want to have two kids, et cetera, et cetera. So once you have that, you can change the specification of your model so that it looks like what we see in the data. And once you do that, you can use your model as a, as a, for experiments. You can do counterfactual experiments. You can say, suppose the wages did not change at all in the last 50 years, how would the marital structure look like? Or you can do policy experiments. Suppose government lowers taxes, would female labor force participation increase? It's like this, I have my computer, we all seen today how wonderful things computer can do. So people enter the computer. You see they are different, they are not all same. Some wear ties and some don't. And then they meet in the computer. Well, nowadays you can actually meet people in the cyberspace, but so they meet in the computer. I can introduce a government into my computer that taxes people or give them benefits and affects their lives. And out of this process comes a population that looks like you. Some are single, some are married, some have one kid, some have two kids, some have one kid, there are single mothers. Now I have my population that I can analyze. It's really fascinating. So let me now tell you a little bit more. I will just talk about a couple specific projects that use this methodology and what you can do with it. Of course, this methodology is not specific about for family economics, many areas in economics use this methodology. 
using computers, using simulations to, to, to generate artificial populations and analyzing them is a very powerful methodology. In a project with colleagues from University of Pennsylvania and Universidad Autónoma, Universidad, Universidad Carlos III de Madrid, we look at family changes, how families change in the United States. We ask, what are the economic forces behind dramatic shift in the household characteristics? Marital status, married female labor supply, increase in education. And our results show that technology, Technology matters a lot. What do I mean by technology? I mean two things. Improvements in household technologies. Household appliances, ranging from refrigerators to microwaves, become available during this period, and they become very cheap. Second, this period, in this period, we witness what's, what economists call skill-biased technological change. Computers and computer-operated machines became an integral part of the production this period. This had two effects. One, it increased the skill premium. Skill premium is the how much a college graduate earns with respect to a non-college graduate. It increased a lot during this period because in order to operate computers and computer-related machines, you need education. We also see a decline in the gender wage gap during this period. When physical strength became less important in the production, and brains become more important, this benefited women more than men. So what does this have to do? First, how you can measure these changes? One way to measure these changes, you can look at their prices. Here are my appliances. Here is, a pri here is, here is their prices. These are quality adjusted relative prices. What does that mean? It means today, if you want to buy an appliance, you work five hours. In 1960, you had to work 100 hours to buy the same appliance. Computers got even much cheaper. Okay. As a result, we see a big increase in skill premium in, in US. It increased from 1.6, which means skilled people, college educated people were earning 60% more than non-college educated people. It increased from 1.6 to 1.9, and then gender gap Decline. Women used to earn about 60% of what men earn. Now they earn about 83%. What these things have to do with the family? Well, they have to do this. Changes in improvements in household appliances, improvements in household technologies greatly affected female labor supply. In some sense, running a household become much, much less labor intensive. These appliances freed out, freed time from the household and so that women can work. They also affected marriages. What these appliances and the changes in the, what these appliances did was they reduced the room for specialization in the marriage. You don't need one person sitting at home and taking care of the household anymore. As a result, people don't marry to enjoy the economic benefit of the marriage. They marry because they like somebody. So they can, so the economic benefits of marriage during this period decline dramatically. What did computers do? They had a big effect on female education, both due to skill premium and the gender gap. They also increased marital sorting. If skill premium is high, then the skill pe people are more picky who they, get, who they get married with. So you see more college people marrying with college people. How do we reach these results? We write down a model, we simulate it, and then we do what-if exercises. What if technology in the household did not change at all? What if skill-based technology did not occur? So it can tell you a lot. Indeed, when you look at the cross-country evidence, there's quite a bit of evidence supporting the main mechanisms. Across countries, you see in countries with higher skill premium, there is more sorting. In Spain, the sorting has been same in the last 20 years. Skill premium is flat as well. You also see that price of household appliances, changes in the price of household appliances had a big effect on female labor force participation across countries as well. Let me tell you another story. In a project with colleagues from Arizona State University from the US and Sabancı University from Turkey, we look at how taxation, taxation affects household labor supply. 
of course, we are not the first one to look at this. There is a big literature that shows that tax changes had, have little effect on labor supply. But this literature relies on models that are populated by single earner households, and they usually look at the behavior of men. What if you look at the behavior of the household as a unit and talk about taxes? Things change quite a bit, because when you lower taxes, females might enter the labor force, or when you increase the taxes, they might leave the labor force. Household as a unit is more elastic in terms of the labor supply behavior than a single individual. So putting family into these models and looking at the taxes can give you different results than before. What we show is that households indeed react larger to the tax changes, and this comes mainly from behavior of married females. Indeed, in ongoing research, what we are, what we are doing or what we are trying to do is rethinking about social insurance programs. What do I mean? What are social insurance programs? Unemployment insurance is a key element. Income transfers to poor families, that's another social insurance program. But when, we, when governments talk about social insurance programs, again, they think about individual. But if we think about family, then maybe providing child care subsidies, which, has, which is a big determinant of female labor force participation, can be a better way to insure families than giving them money when they are unemployed. So in some sense, our research forces us to think social insurance policies and family policies under the same umbrella. Again, this comes from building a model where families and not the individual is at the center. Finally, with colleagues from Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, we are looking at Spain. Why is fertility so low in Spain? And our very preliminary results show that flexibility in the, if you want to have higher fertility, flexibility in the labor market helps. What do I mean by flexibility in the labor market? Here is a picture that shows fraction of firms that allow flexible hours arrangement. You can work less today, and maybe in the future you work more. They allow you to do that. And countries with higher fertility have all higher flexibility, and here are the low fertility ones. So of course, women who want to have kids prefer flexibility. They want flexibility. Specifically for Spain, our results also show that temporary contracts don't help with fertility. Here is the probability of having a child, conditional on not having one. Permanent contracts, 20%. Temporary contracts, 5%. Big difference. Most probably, with temporary contracts, people don't feel secure enough to have children. So we are investigating now these topics. So just to conclude, this is an family economics is an exciting area, and welcome to it. Thank you.